Welcome to the New Church Podcast. So, I know that you probably have something you need to talk to God about. Because, I mean, I know most of you. And most of you have told me various things that you need to talk to God about. And uh, what we're going to be talking about today is what's the best way to do that? That's what we're going to be talking about today. What does it actually... What is, how does Jesus want us to pray? So, with that in mind, here's our scripture for the day. Um, it starts off, the text comes from Matthew chapter 6, starting with verse 5. And it says this, When you pray... Don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on the street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. Tell you the truth, that's all the reward they're ever going to get. But when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you. Pray to your Father in private. And then your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on like the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them. For your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask Him. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, well your Father will not forgive your sins. And then in Luke chapter 11, we have another account of Jesus teaching this prayer to his disciples. So this is Luke chapter 11. Once Jesus was in a certain place praying, and as he finished, one of his disciples came to him and he said, Lord, teach us to pray, like John taught his disciples. And Jesus said, well, this is how you should pray. Father, May your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. Give us each day the food we need. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation. And then Jesus, teaching them more about prayer, he used this story. He said, suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight. You want to to borrow three loaves of bread, and you tell your friend, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit, I don't have anything for him to eat. And then suppose your friend calls from his bedroom, don't bother me, the door's locked for the night, my family and I are on bed, I can't help you. We've all been there, right? (laughs) Uh, I tell you this, even though he won't do it for friendship's sake. If you keep knocking long enough, he will get up, and he'll give you whatever you need just because of your shameless persistence. And so I tell you, keep on asking. You will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. You fathers, if your children asked for a fish, would you give them a snake instead? Or if they asked for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. This is the word of the Lord. So, 
that was, that was two accounts of the Lord's Prayer. The first one, the Matthew account, is well, it's a pretty serious warning against trying to be like super spiritual and impressive with our prayers, using fancy words and going on and on and on. It's a warning against repeating words in some kind of meaningless chant. And then it ends up being focused on how we should forgive other people the way God's forgiven us or else he won't forgive us. But then the Luke account, that has a completely different tone, doesn't it? Like one of the disciples asked Jesus to teach him how to pray. And then Jesus gives a really short, simple prayer. And he ends up comforting them that if they need something, if they need anything, they should just ask God for it. And they should be persistent. Keep asking till you get what you came for. Whatever need you bring to God, man, he already knows what they are and he wants to help us. He just wants us to ask. Which is pretty great news, isn't it? Especially if we keep in mind that when we ask for something in prayer, one of the potential answers is no. Because a lot of times we're asking for things that would be bad for us. You know, like we're the ones who are asking for a snake. He says, no, how about a fish instead? Tastes better. Basically, when we're praying, it's a good thing to remember which one of us is God. That he's the father and we're the child. So anyway, those are the two accounts where we get the Lord's Prayer. But did you notice that neither one of them have the ending that we're used to saying? That for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory ending of the Lord's Prayer. That's called the doxology, which means to give praise. And the earliest record that we have of this phrase being added to the Lord's Prayer is from a little handbook that was written in the first century, which was the same time that all the rest of the New Testament was written. It's in a little book called the Didache, or the Teaching of the Apostles. It's actually an awesome little book, sort of a manual for how to do ministry in the first century. And there's a section where it's talking about how Christians should pray, and it says, pray to the Father as follows, our Father who art in heaven, and then it says the Lord's Prayer, and then it ends the way we always end it. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. But then it adds this. It says, say this prayer three times a day, morning, afternoon, and evening. That's a first century record of how the early Christians prayed. Three times a day, they would say the Lord's Prayer, followed by the doxology, which makes sense. Because it was common practice for Jewish prayers to end with some sort of doxology. And this one, it pretty much comes from 1 Chronicles 29, where King David, he prayed this. He said, Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. And that was a common doxology. It's one that Jesus would have prayed in the synagogues. So that's where we get the Lord's Prayer. And the version that most of us know by heart, the one that we pray at the end of our service every week, it comes from the 1611 King James Version of the Bible. And since we say this prayer every week, I thought it might be a good idea for us to spend a little bit of time thinking about what we're actually saying in this prayer so we don't end up doing exactly what Jesus told us not to do, repeating empty words and phrases just to sound spiritual. Let's pray as we get started with this this morning. Father in heaven, we ask that you would teach us how to pray that you would challenge us to pray more and help us to pay attention to what we're saying when we pray. 
Show us that you're always listening. You're always there to hear us, listening with compassion and love and mercy and grace. Amen. So, talking about prayer, that prayer, that last resort when it doesn't seem like anything else can be done. It's finally come to this then. All we can do now, I guess, is pray. But we're always telling people what we'll pray for them. We find out something's going on in someone's life, and we're like, oh, I'm so sorry. I will definitely keep you in my prayers. And we say that like that actually means something, right? Like we have this strict routine of daily prayer that's just built into the top priority of our everyday life. And now we're going to add their concern to our very organized list of prayers that we most certainly do every day. We're going to keep them in our prayers. Uh Uh-huh. Or sometimes people will say, send in prayers and good vibes, positive thoughts. Our thoughts and prayers are with you. What does that even mean? How are positive vibes supposed to help anyone? Here, let me radiate some positive vibes out into this room. There. That ought to be about enough for this morning. So if all these, pay, all these people are praying all the time, if they really do pray, who are they praying to? There was this guy who was taking a skydiving class, and the instructor is showing him how to put on his parachute jump out of the plane, count to 10, pull the rip cord. And he said, and if the parachute doesn't come out, then count to 10 again and pull the backup chute. And the guy says, well, yeah, but what if that one doesn't work either? And the instructor said, well, if the backup chute doesn't work, then try to clear your mind and say, Buddha, Buddha, Buddha. And then a giant hand is going to come out of the clouds and it's going to carry you safely to the ground. So the big day finally comes for his first jump. He jumps out of the plane, he pulls the ripcord, and nothing happens. So he pulls the back up. That doesn't work either. And in desperation, freaking out, he screams, Buddha, Buddha, Buddha. And amazingly, a giant hand comes out of the clouds and gently lowers him to the earth. And then just as he's stepping out of the giant hand, he says, thank God. And immediately the hand flips over and smashes him into the ground. (laughs) See, it matters who you pray to. And if you're not praying to our Father in heaven through God the Son, by the Holy Spirit, then you're not really praying to God. I mean, you might be praying to something, but it's not the true God. And that should be a frightening thought. See, Jesus is the final revelation of God to mankind. That's the whole point of all this. But I'm not saying that we all have to have perfect theology, be perfect theologians when we pray, because any prayer that is said in faith, it's going to be heard. Because of Jesus, we can even be forgiven of bad theology, guys. But that doesn't mean we have to stay ignorant and foolish in our theological understanding. See, that's also the whole point of this. And some of the worst theology in the world It happens when we pray. Because, like, we'll start off praying to the Lord, but before you know it, we've got the Father on the cross, and we've got baby Jesus sitting on the throne in heaven, like something from Talladega Nights. They'll start talking about grace and love and peace and justification and redemption until they've weaved such a mess of pious-sounding words but they don't even know what they're talking about anymore. 
I'm a little bit afraid that when I die, God's going to make me listen to some of the recordings of my sleepy time prayers. The ones that kind of start off with good intentions and slowly morph into shopping lists and song lyrics before I fall asleep. There's probably this whole fail blog YouTube channel in heaven that's just dedicated to broadcasting bad prayers. I remember a few times when I was putting Angel to bed when he was really little, and he'd be praying, and he'd be like, God, please best bless Mommy and Daddy and Vaughn and... And I'd be waiting for whatever else he wanted God to bless, but he was gone. He was asleep. Prayer was over, like mid-sentence. Another thing that can be really scary is that we're never in more danger of being total and complete hypocrites than when we pray in front of other people, which is what the Matthew account, that's what that's talking about. Because we want to sound smart, right? Like we know what we're talking about. We want to use religious sounding words and phrases. But who are we trying to impress? Are we trying to impress God? No, we're trying to impress the people that we're praying in front of. Then there's all those Father God we just prayers. Where people insert Father God we just between every phrase, like, Father God, we just come to you now, Father God, and we just ask that you'd be with us, Father God. Can you imagine, like, if my kids came to me and talked to me like that? They walk up to me and they're like, Father, we just come to you now, Father, and we ask that you would just give us $20, Father, just $20, knowing that thou art kind and generous and to your beloved children. I actually think this is why people are so intimidated about praying out loud, because they've heard so many other people get weird about it. But see, Jesus was pretty clear. He doesn't want us to be that guy. He doesn't want us to be weird about it. He just wants us to talk to him. But it's intimidating because we don't want to look dumb or phony or be a hypocrite. So we're tempted to avoid any situation where we might have to pray out loud, right? But that's not the right solution either. We don't need to be afraid to talk to God in front of other people. But here's the thing. The Lord's Prayer, it's not really about praying in a group even though that's pretty much how we use it. Most of us only say the Lord's Prayer when we're in a worship service like this, right? But Jesus was actually teaching his disciples about how to pray when they're alone. That it's important to get alone, to go to a private place and pray. What if I told you that the whole point of all this gospel Jesus church thing. The whole point is about prayer. So we could talk to God. So we could have a conversation with God, have a relationship with him. For God to hear us and give us what we need. Give us the very desires of our true heart. That he already knows what we need. But he wants us to ask anyway. He wants us to talk to him, to be reminded of who he is, to be reminded of who we are, what we're here to do, who we're becoming. See, conversation with God, it changes us. It changes everything. Jesus came to earth so that we could be in a right relationship with God. That's why. It's all about being able to pray. It's all about our prayers being carried to God the Father by Jesus Christ the Son 
through the Holy Spirit. I mean, otherwise our words are just going to fall to the ground because the filth and the darkness of our souls, it's going to keep those words from ascending to heaven. Our blind and self-centered, delusional, wicked hearts, they're not even going to want to pray in the first place, not unless God reaches out to us first. See, that's the gospel. God reaches out to us first. God comes to us. We don't go to him. He might be coming to you right now, using this morning to let you know that he loves you and he wants to give you hope and peace and meaning. Whatever it is you're facing in your life, he wants you to bring it to him, to cast your cares on him. Do that and he'll give you the desires of your heart, comfort, healing, restoration, And you don't have to be a good person. You don't have to get your act together. See, that's the whole point. He does that for us. Salvation is a free gift. We're saved by grace through faith because of Jesus. So trust in him. Bring your cares to him. That's what prayer is. It's the whole point of the gospel that Jesus is our mediator, our advocate. That he died on the cross, that he rose from the dead, he ascended to heaven to make constant intercession, to pray for us constantly with the Father. And because of Jesus, we can all go boldly before the throne of God and say, what? What should we say? I mean, Jesus died and rose from the dead so that we could talk to God, so that we could pray. But what are we supposed to say? What are the words that we're supposed to use? See, one of the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And then Jesus gave them a prayer that is so short, so simple, that like a young child can remember it. When Angel was like three years old, I had Kim carry him up on stage at one of my concerts, and he led the whole audience in the Lord's Prayer at three years old. It's just 66 words. So over the next few weeks, we're going to look at those words, and we're going to explore what they mean, what they teach us about how to pray and what to pray for, how they're supposed to form us into be, being disciples and followers of Jesus. So I read the two places where the Lord's Prayer is in the, in the Bible, from Matthew and from Luke. And in Matthew, it's in the context of Jesus talking about how prayers shouldn't be so pretentious. And in Luke, the point is that God wants to give us what we need. But in both cases, notice, it's very clear. Prayer is important. Jesus got alone and prayed all the time. So here's a challenge that I have for all of us as we start this series. Here's the challenge. I want us to all pray the Lord's Prayer three times a day. First thing in the morning when you get up. In the afternoon, maybe lunchtime. And then in the evening, before you go to bed, three times a day. Can we do that? Will you do that? There were these two men who were walking together one day. And the first one said to the other one, Yeah, well, if you know so much about spiritual things, if you're so religious, let's hear you quote the Lord's Prayer. I'll bet you $10 you can't do it. And the second guy was like, Yeah, no problem. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. The first guy laughs and he says, gets his wallet, finds a $10 bill and he hands it to him. He says, 
I didn't think you could do it. <laughs> you probably have the Lord's Prayer memorized, but if you don't, it shouldn't take you very long to get that done. See, the basic pattern of the Lord's Prayer is this. First, we remember who we're praying to and what our relationship to him is, our Father who art in heaven. That's who we're praying to. That's who we are. Second, we remember our responsibilities in following Jesus. So to hallow his name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then third, we bring our requests. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So three times a day, start your day in the presence of God. And then take a moment to remind yourself in the afternoon that you're still following Jesus, even at work. And then end your day by like giving it all back to him. But when you're praying through this, don't rush through it without thinking about each word and phrase. Let them just kind of sit there for a moment. Let them work on you. Let them fill your mind, enter your heart. And then next week, we're going to start going through the meaning of each word and phrase, each petition. And then as we do that, in the upcoming weeks, we're going to let that prayer become a template, an outline to give shape to our prayer life. Guys, this is what it means to be a Christian, a Christ follower. It means that we've been saved by grace through faith. And now we want to be faithful. We want to do what Jesus told us to do. And this is how he told us to pray. I know you have things you need to talk to God about. And I also know he's listening.